Good afternoon. Welcome to our conversation about Pal Joey. Pal Joey opens up our 38th season at Arkansas Rep, and we're so honored to kick off our 38th season right back here at the Clinton School. Our partnership with our friends here at the Clinton School has been a hallmark of the Rep's activities for the last several years, and it gives us the opportunity to dig a little deeper and to discuss with you some of the themes and ideas that we bring to our stage. We always want to give the opportunity to our audience, to our community, to learn as much about the artistic process and about the work that goes on behind the scenes. And our opportunity to meet with you guys today is central to that goal. And we're joined today by a very distinguished panel. This is the creative team that has for quite some time been working on Pal Joey, which you will see if you haven't come down to one of our preview performances yet. Hope you all come down and see the production as it runs over the course of the next month. So let's, let me ask each of our panel members to introduce themselves and let us know what you're doing here. Michael, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Michael. Is this on? Do I need it? Okay. Oh, there we are. I'm Michael Reno. Um, I'm the music supervisor, arranger, and orchestrator uh, for the show, essentially, as Peter says, everything music. My name is Patrick Pacheco, and I wrote the book, which is also often known as the libretto for the musical. And I'm Peter Schneider, the director of this particular production. And you know, ordinarily, for those of you and many of you who come to all of these, we bring uh, actors to talk about creating their roles. But you know, we've talked about Pal Joey, even though it was written in 1940 uh, by Oscar Hammerstein and Lorenzo Hart, we are talking about, and you've read the press, you've noticed, we talk about the world premiere of Pal Joey. And so we thought it'd be very interesting today to have a conversation with the creative team that's been working on this play. So let me begin with Peter and Patrick and Michael, and I'll let you guys take this in whatever order you want to talk about why are we talking about this musical, uh, which was written in 1940, and which, if you look at its history, has had a revival in almost every decade since 1940? Why are we talking about this production as a world premiere? Oh, boy. Um, I'll, I'll go first here. Uh, about five or six years ago, Patrick and I got together to talk about what would be our next project. We've made uh, several other things together. And I've always been attracted to what is the excitement of charismatic men who may have sexual proclivities or sexual flaws or have that tremendous magnetism um, about them about men who are powerful, talented, ambitious, creative, and potentially have flaws. And what is it about this that is very attractive to people? And when, we, when I started to look around the canon of literature, Pal Joey is exactly, or I felt could be exactly that as a particular musical to adapt. Now, Pal Joey's been around since 1940, had a very successful movie in 1957, a revival in 1952, but the show has never been really successful beyond the early 40s. It's had revivals, been unsuccessful, it's gotten rather bad reviews. It's never really been a show that people say, oh yes, pal Joey, I love it. You say you love the movie, you love Frank Sinatra, you love some of the songs, but the musical itself has never been successful. And the estate, the Rogers and Hart estate, has for the last 30 years tried to figure out why this musical has not been successful and has hired various book writers, librettists, to adapt the original book that was written by John O'Hara. So there's been Terence McNally, Richard Greenberg, David Ives, have all taken a crack at trying to fix Pal Joey. And five years ago, I said to Ted Chapin, who is the uh, president of the Rogers and Hammerstein estate, which is also the executors of Rogers and Hart, could we take a crack at redoing our version of it, and Patrick and I have now spent, along with Michael, the last five years trying to figure out how to solve the version of Pal Joey. And the central tenet, I'll let Patrick talk a bit more about that, was even though, as they would say in the parlance, Joey is a cad, a bit of a womanizer, and unlikable, I was trying to figure out, can you make him understandable? Can you take it and, you know, I, I'm sitting here in the Clinton Library and I've got to be very careful. Um, <laughs> because, truthfully, this character is modeled after Bill Clinton. 
and I'm, fa I'm, a fa I'm fascinated by Bill. I've, I've spent time with him, I find him charismatic, I find him extraordinary, and yet some people think he's a cad. Don't record that. I think it's too late, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I try to explore the issue of why is it that one can understand the man. I think that was our goal, to try and make Joey, if not likable, understandable and charismatic and talented. In the original version, Joey was untalented. So in our version, Joey happens to be really talented. And, uh, Peter, give the audience a 30-second plot summary of Pal Joey, because they may not, they may not. <laughs> and I didn't that mean, is I didn't, Loretto's problem. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I think some of our audience may yeah, not know it, the I exact, just the plot overview. Yeah, what is the plot of Pal Joey, Patrick? Um, in in, in the 1930s, John O'Hara, who wrote other novels such as Butterfield 8 and Appointment in Samara, wrote a series of short stories uh, called Pal Joey, and they were published in The New Yorker. And in 1940, he went to Rogers and Hart and asked, uh, thought that they could adapt it into a musical. And he wrote the book about this untalented, uh, second-rate, nightclub singer in a second-rate club in Chicago who had the ambition to own a nightclub and would do anything in the world to own it, including becoming sexually involved with an older, rich socialite by the character's name of Vera. Uh, at the same time, um, he meets a young lady, a young ingenue, Linda, and falls in love with her, and there is this sort of menage a trois going on among the three of them. And uh, because he was sort of a second-rate, untalented nightclub singer, as Peter says, that sort of created, in the long run, a problem, what they call in the American musical theater canon a problem musical. Rodgers and Hammerstein, who owns the rights to the catalog, as well as the Rodgers and Hart catalog, would never want a revision of The Sound of Music. It's a, it's a perfect musical. The, the, the Carousel book is great. But among some of their properties are what they call problem musicals. And this was one of the problem musicals because of many of the reasons Peter uh, just described. And you, so you, our challenge was to, was to fix it. Our challenge then was to look at it. So when Peter came to me uh, about five years ago, and, and we've worked on this off and on. We haven't worked nonstop for five years. Uh, I looked at the book and I looked at the stakes in terms of what, because musicals are often very much A, about what is at stake for a character, and they are often, especially the American musical theater, is often about a central character like Fanny Bryce and Funny Girl or uh, the character and how to succeed in business or people that want something and they want it so bad and that's one of the cardinal rules that Michael would certainly agree with and that is that you want something so bad that you have to sing about it. So it was <laughs> so it was a question of what were the stakes and the stakes seemed very low uh, for this show as it was written originally by John O'Hara. So the first thing that we looked at was how can we raise the stakes? And one of the, there was two parts to that. One was it was in 1940. In 1940, America was obviously on the brink of war. Europe was already at war. And that cynicism pervaded the original book. I suggested that we update it to 1948 because I found post-war America, 1948, was an exciting time, a very sexy time. It was the Beat Generation. It was John Kerouac and Neil Cassidy and uh, Allen Ginsberg. It was also a time of great fermentation, cultural fermentation in America uh, and racial uh, progress. Um, Jackie Robinson had broken the color barrier in pro baseball. Joe Lewis was the heavyweight champ of the world, and Harry Truman had integrated the armed forces, which brought us to our second uh, ch major change, which was to make Joey black, Vera white, Linda black, and bring in the interracial element as well. This raised the stakes quite a lot, because it's very loaded for an African-American man to become involved with a white socialite woman. But, but even more important to me in terms of making him black was the fact that he wanted to be part of the white clubs, and there was a reason why a talented, charismatic, successful man was not making it. It really helped the stakes, not only the sexual stakes, but also helped the emotional stakes, which is 
Joey has an obstacle which is not just him, uh, not just his character flaw. There's a society uh, pressure that says you gotta keep in your place. That comes down to what Peter was saying in terms of making him understandable, why he has not been able to advance in that culture. And one thing that I found fascinating in looking at the beat culture of 1948 is that Neil Cassidy and Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg were all middle-aged white men who were fascinated with Amer African American culture. In a sense, they wanted to be uh, black. They were fascinated by jazz and that world. And I felt that there was something poignant. We felt that there was something poignant in an African American wanting to be a part of the white culture, wanting to be, have a piece of the American dream, which in those, in his terms, at least his own personal terms, having grown up poor um, and black, there was something poignant in the way that he defined it for himself, was, which was to succeed in the white world. There's an exchange at one point where Linda says to him, this African-American waitress who he becomes involved with, she says, it's that black club that you're, white, it's white, white club, club, thank you, white club that you're performing at, and he says, is there any other kind if you wanna make it? So that was sort of the sort of the, the, sort of the underrooted principle. The other thing was the music, because as we all talk about, it's not a talkical, it's not a danceical, it's a musical. People have to sing, and the score is very well known from this particular musical. There's Bewitched, Bothered and Bewildered, there's I Could Write a Book, there's uh, Zip, there's Plant You Now, there's all sorts of standards that are from this show. And one of the first things we did was say, what songs should go and what songs should come in. I want Michael to talk about the music, because basically with having composers who are no longer alive, you have to have somebody substitute for them. Usually when you're working on a new musical, the composer's sitting in the room and you say, ah, that song doesn't work, rewrite it. Rewrite those lyrics, change that tune. In this case, you can't do that because it's Rogers and Hart. So Michael had other challenges. We're gonna talk about the songs in, out, and... Sure. Um... I, there were several musical challenges. One was, as Peter mentioned, uh, not all the songs were necessarily gold in the show. Um, but we're dealing with Richard Rogers here, for pity's sake. You know, he wrote Sound of Music, Oklahoma, Carousel, King and I. He's like, you know, the, the godfather of American musical theater. So I, there, I entered this project with trepidation um, because I, I was acting as the surrogate composer. What we did was, number one, get rid of songs that we just, as Patrick said when he saw the last iteration in New York, people would start futzing with their programs during these club numbers. He said, okay, well, that's easy. We'll get rid of them. And luckily, Ted Chapin said, you can have access to the Rogers and Hart Library, meaning we could bring in songs from other sources that they had written songs for, other musicals they wrote prior to this, movies. Um, one of the initial challenges, besides looking at the songs and assessing them, what should stay, what should go, was trying to ad adapt this conversation, uh, the, the concept of being in 1948 and in, in, the, in the beat generation. This is something that doesn't exist in the original music at all, and to try to tell that story musically by introducing a jazz element to the show to help tell the story. The, the, my goal uh, was to try to figure out how to tell the story these guys wanted to tell through music, um, and it all had to be an adaptation. I obviously cannot rewrite Richard Rogers. I can, I can take a different take on it, and that's what we tried to do, not only with the entire show, trying to tell the story in a new way, try to make, present these songs in a new way. Um, everybody, not everybody knows, a lot of people know um, the lady, lady is a tramp. Bewitched, um, another famous ballad from the show is a song called um, I Could Write a Book that Joey and hit the ingenue, hit the girl, uh, meet. Well, in the original version, they never sing together. They, he sings a verse, they talk, she sings a verse, end of number. And I thought, well, what a wasted opportunity is this? They should sing together. Um, so I created a moment where it's, I call it my Nelson Eddy Jeanette McDonald moment. And for me, it's the moment they fall in love. That's what I was trying to do. In a musical, anything that's important, the highest emotion, the highest things that are at stake need to happen in a song. And that's one of the things that 
that made Pal Joey a problem musical. These things did not happen in song. Joey needs to express what he wants, as Patrick mentioned. So we had to create a song saying, here's what I want, Joey, and it has to happen in a song. Joey and Linda have to fall in love. It has to happen in the song. So I, for me, from my point of view, created that moment where it happens. At the end of the show, Joey has to have a realization that, oh, you know what, maybe I have been a cad. Maybe I could live life differently. That realization should happen in a song. It, didn't, it wasn't in the original. So we created a moment where, for me, I know the specific moment now, where it happens and it's in a song. So hopefully, the music is still being true to Richard Rogers and Lauren's heart, but being presented in a new way, reconceived along with everything else, and still be faithful to the original and new all at the same time. I think that was our goal, to make things new, to not make this feel dusty, to not make this feel like a revival. Uh, when you go, and there are many productions that are fantastic of various old musicals, and they have an old-fashioned romantic quality to them. You go, oh, isn't that love that reminds me of when I was young, or when I first saw it. And I suppose that's something I hate in life, right? <laughs> you say, Patrick, um, that I really want to look forward, and for me, this is a forward-looking musical. It is trying to deal with the issues of today in a way that's accessible that is musically based. And which is, again, just talking about the music, when you know Zip or Plant You Now or Flower, whatever that song is called, Flower Garden. Flower Garden of My Heart, these are all numbers that happen in the club. So directorially, what you're seeing on the stage is backstage, onstage, bedroom, living room, kitchen. But the central tenet is we're in a nightclub. And my tenet to these gentlemen was, every song that's sung in the nightclub must have some emotional resonance on Joey. There must be some reason that the song is there in the club that is telling Joey's tale. So if you look at Terrific Rainbow, which is a number that is in the original song, movie, in the, in the original theater show, we overlap dialogue into it because Linda, if you are if it's emotionally working, Linda is Joey's terrific rainbow, right? So when, when you, again, you should not be thinking this when you're watching the show, you should not be seeing this, you should be feeling it. That you should just feel the music compelling you and taking you along, but it also is telling the story as we go along. And there's lots of times when we've overlapped dialogue. In the rehearsal process, we had a scene where Linda's pissed off because she discovers that Joey's two-timing her and she comes down, there's a little scene, and then she has a song. And the actress said, but shouldn't those two things be overlapped? Shouldn't I be singing? Because, as Michael said, this is my emotional slap him in the face and stomp on him and walk out. But I have that scene where I slap him, stomp on him, and then I walk off and sing a song. Can't you put those two things together? And the minute we put them together, of course, the moment is much better because it's being done in song. She has no dialogue. She just sings the song as Michael has composed it, and we overlap the dialogue. And it's a very clever trick, and it's one of the highlights of the moment. It's, it's a great, right, Jim, when you saw it, right? It's kind of one of those great moments where you go, oh, that's kind of clever, right? <laughs> and so I think that's what we're trying to do over and over again, is in our creative process, which is why we're here in Little Rock and at the good auspices of Bob, is because you need some place that is accustomed to dealing and creating new work. It changes every day. Uh, we're putting a new line in tonight because something's not clear. Uh, we put a whole new scene in on Tuesday because we changed a song, we cut a song, we've rewritten this. That is why we come to Little Rock. A, it's far away from the prying eyes of New York. <laughs> because you have to have a safe place to work on something, right? And secondarily, you have a very good facility here. Bob has a terrific theater, a terrific staff that allows us all to be creative together and to you sort of, you know, rework our work together without it being under too much pressure. There's a lot of pressure, but not too much pressure. Oh, I, I'll ask a question. Ah, um, you know, we can natter on here forever, Bob. <laughs> um, 
You talk about this being a five-year process, and here we are in Little Rock. This is certainly not the end of Pal Joey's journey, but it is a stop along the way. Talk to us, walk us through what it, what it's, what have you been doing for five years? Um, Ask as a producer, how did you spend all that money and was it worth it? Is that what the question was, Bob? Yeah, kind of. I mean, what, you know, five years, it's a two-hour show. How long can it take? What? Um, <laughs> I mean, I realize, I realize, that, but, but what, no, these how, things, does, how does the play evolve right. to where it is today? It, these new shows usually take five to six years to get from the day you have the idea. Gosh, that's an interesting idea to putting it on some sort of stage in a successful way. And sort of is, that is the journey, that's the traditional kind of journey of creation. And it goes from, you have to acquire the rights, because the first thing you have to do when you do anything, whether it's new, old, is somebody has to give you permission to do it. And that takes time. It just is lawyers negotiating, Max, thank you. It's lawyers negotiating to get the rights, and you pay some money to do that. And then you sort of assemble the creative team, and you sit around for six to nine months discussing, arguing, fighting, reading, working, composing, uh, changing things, doing things. And we say, oh, after a year, you sort of say, have a, have a script that's written and some music that's written. You go, I think that's pretty darn good. And then you gather some actors in a room, very much like this, and you sit around a table, and they read it for you, and they sing the songs, or Michael sings the songs, the actors. And you go, well, that just didn't work at all, did it? Um, the fundamental idea probably works, but the songs aren't in the right order. The dialogue isn't quite right. The emotional content isn't adding up. So you go away and you spend another six months rewriting it, just slogging away to change things. And then you get what equity calls, which is the actors' union, gets a, what you call a 29-hour reading because actors get paid based on what theater size, how long, how short. But to help the creation, equity has been very helpful and says, you can hire actors for a week, 29 hours, pay them $100, and they can sit around the table and work with you. So you sort of put together the 12 actors, and you gather them all together, and Michael spends three of the, he spends 18 of the 29 hours teaching them music, maybe 20 hours teaching them music, because without them singing the music correctly, you don't know what you have. So they have to sing the music correctly. So we spend 18 of the 20 hours teaching the music, and then reading the book, and they stand behind music stands with an invited audience, just like you, about the same size, and they do it. And there's no sets, there's no lights, there's no costumes, there's nothing, and they just say the words and sing the songs. And then you go, well, that didn't work again. <laughs> so we go back and redo it again. We spend another six months. This is it's true, that's how it's done. And you sort of rework it again. And now maybe you do another reading or maybe you do a production. So we happen to get lucky and Michael and I happened to be apprentices 40 years ago at the Barn Theater in Augusta, Michigan. And they just happened to be looking for a show because one of their shows fell out and Michael said, let's do Pal Joey at the Barn Theater. So we went for two weeks, less than two weeks, rehearsed it for eight, nine days and jammed it onto a stage in Augusta, Michigan. And the cast was wrong, leading actress was wrong, the bed was wrong, the sheets were bad, oh my God, the housing was horrible. Okay, um, I get distracted. Um, and we throw it up, and most, one of the most important things is for audience's reaction, because the audience tells you a lot. We can go create all we want in a room, but until you arrive and say, oh, well, that was just dull, or you laugh, or you don't laugh, or you applaud, or you don't applaud. It tells us so much in terms of, oh, that moment's just not working. And we discovered many things out of the Barn Theater production that just didn't work. It was a perfect, it's a lovely production. It was wonderful, it was very successful. It, it, the audience goes, oh, we like that. And we go, well, it just didn't work, did it? Okay, so we go back and we write a new song. Michael writes a, a song, the quartet. We, we add Joey, we do this, we do that. And now we, I send the script to Bob, and I say, Bob, we now need light sets, costumes, and a home, and three weeks of rehearsal, and more professional actors, and more this and more that, and Bob, bless his heart, says yes. And then we spend the next six months, seven months, preparing this version of the script, 
we get to Little Rock and we rip it apart and pull it apart. The actors work again for the first two weeks, learning the music, learning the lines that were what we walked in with, and then we rip it all apart again because certain things aren't working. And Bob gives us notes, and we give our own notes, and we rip it apart again, and we put it back together again, and now we present it to the Little Rock community, and we are, I would say, 93% happy, would you say? Yeah. Yeah, I think I we're... Like I, I know. I think, again, I'll let these guys talk, but I think part of the process as an artist is when you present your work to anybody, you show a sketch, you show a painting, you're convinced it's finished. That's it, I'm done. And someone says, oh, I love it, but the blue isn't quite right. And then you look at it and you go, God darn it, the blue's not quite right. They're right. And you go back and keep working on it. So for me, 93% is pretty darn good in my book because there's always something you can do better. The next time out, we know the first something isn't working. We know this moment isn't quite working. You won't see it, but we know that we want to heighten and improve that. You want to talk about this at all? I was just going to say there's two um, sayings that we use in theater all the time. Plays are written, musicals are rewritten. Um, the other one is write a play, kill a tree, write a musical, kill a forest. <laughs> in terms of the ongoing rewriting process, it never ends um, until somebody like says, stop, leave it alone, we'll, we'll take what we got. And tonight I have said stop. Right, so as of 4 o'clock this afternoon, we have rehearsal at 2 o'clock, as of 4 o'clock this afternoon, I'm just saying stop. And it's probably the most depressing moment for me um, because you just want to fix it all the time. And I was talking to Max beforehand, you just can't get the actors to make the changes anymore without more rehearsal time. You just can't say to an actor, Oh, that line you say in Act Two, you know, the one where you uh, change that to and as opposed to a but, right? Whatever the line is. And they'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, I can do that. And then they cannot do it. They just don't remember it. Their brain, their body memory, it is about memory. It's a, it's a body function that, that it's, it, it, they just can't, at some point, you've got to stop making changes. But that can be good. You can overwork a paint. You can overwork a painting. You can overwork a show. Interesting enough, I, I write for Art and Antiques or wrote Brat Art and Antiques, and I did an interview with many painters, and they talked about losing the painting. They would work on it obsessively so long that unless a studio assistant or their partner or spouse yanked it off the easel, they would destroy the painting, and that happens in musicals as well in shows. Uh, Ragtime, I think. Uh, might be an example. When I saw Ragtime in Toronto, it was raw, but that energy was really raw, and the producer at the time, Garth Drabinsky, insisted on working it and working it and working it into perfection. And in the process, by the time it arrived in New York on Broadway, it had lost that raw energy and lost the Tony Award to Lion King. Lion King. <laughs> I was not unhappy about that, um, having produced The Lion King. But I think, I think, again, if we were in a different situation, i.e. a Broadway uh, production, you preview now for four or five weeks on Broadway now, as opposed to what you do here, you get two previews and then you open. That's just the economic reality of regional theater and most theaters in America. But on Broadway, the system has changed dramatically. That. Uh, shows start previewing on a Tuesday, and four or five weeks later, you freeze them. That's what, when, I, when you say stop, you call it freezing the show. And therefore, for the uh, four or five weeks you're in preview, you, were work at, you perform at night and you rehearse during the day. So the actors work five hours in the afternoon and three hours at night every day for four weeks. And you keep changing and changing and changing and changing and changing and changing until you have it right, because the audience is such a huge participant in giving you feedback, which is, I didn't know that happened. And Pat, I say this to Patrick a lot, but he says, it's written there. The actor says that happens. <laughs> and for some reason, you're not hearing it. And that's what we have to listen to. Max was talking earlier to me about listening, about listening to people speaking and figuring out what they're trying to say. So what we're doing these next few days is listening to the audience. There's another saying in the theater, which is uh, one, uh, one night audiences are dumb, 
a week's worth of audiences are genius because the uh, process changes, the audience change. They'll, they'll change, uh, they'll laugh in some moments one night and not in another. And it's only over a week's time that you get a true sense of the audience response. But Peter's absolutely right, that participation is crucial. It's the last element to be added to a show. A show doesn't exist until you're sitting in those seats. And, and the show will change between today and closing night. It won't change in terms of text, it won't change in terms of the music, but the actors will finally settle down and know what they're doing, right? As opposed to last night, the actor dashing off stage saying, now what am I supposed to be wearing in the next 30 seconds? Where is it? Oh my God, I, 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 am I wearing the red shirt or the blue shirt? Oh, okay. And then dashing back on stage. By the time, true, it's very true, that's what's happening. They're, by next week or the week after, he will know that he wears the blue shirt at this moment because we've changed the color of the shirt nine times, so he's gotten confused. So next week he'll know, because we won't make a change, that the blue shirt happens at this moment. He'll walk off stage, put the blue shirt on, and come back in more in tune with the scene, more relaxed, not struggling for everything that's going on. And therefore the show, what we call, settles down and finds the actors find a rhythm. And then the corollary is the actors get sloppy and lazy and stop doing what you told them to do the first time. And then the show loses its texture, its rhythm, it's, it's, it's sort of, it's why making movies is so much fun, is because once you have it, the actors can't mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll quote you on that when I... Uh... No, well, yes you can. Please do quote <laughs> me to that actor last night, That's please. Definitely. Okay, here's the question, how do you measure success? As an audience member, you measure success when you come to the theater and you have a, an enjoyable, thrilling, fun, eye-opening, engaging, unforgettable experience in the darkened house with actors telling a story. That's how I think an audience measures success. At the Rep, we measure success in the context of our season. We measure success in terms of how plays uh, do financially. We measure success about how it moves our institution forward artistically. How do you guys, in a month, when this show closes, how will you measure success? That I'm not in an asylum. <laughs> <laughs> I'm setting a high bar. Michael, you were that question? That's a tough question. How will I measure success? Um, if I think the majority of what we did worked, if Peter said, if he thinks we're 90% there, if the consensus seems to be from you, from, from the audience, from uh, we as a creative team, you know, if, if we can't think that we have to throw out half the show, which is literally where we've been many, many times, it's like, you know, half of this isn't working. If we can be at a place where, you know what, we are like at least 90% there, meaning 90% of what we're doing is working, I, at this point, I'll take that as a great measure of success. You know, I think this is the most difficult question because um, as ambitious and successful people, uh, which I'm sure everybody in this room is and we try and think we are, um, it's the most important question, which is what are your goals and how do you know at the end of the day you did, you did enough that, you know, um, on your tombstone, I would like to have he did enough. and. I think it's, for me it's very, the most personal question because it comes from bad parenting, as I say, in terms of you're just not good enough. And I would like to think that I'm good enough someday, but maybe not today. Um, I have struggled this question with this particular project for the last five years because where the heck are we going with it? I think for me, the journey is the success as opposed to the end result. And I'll talk about the end result in a second. But for me, it's been the journey of these five years, working with Patrick, with Michael, with Dan, with the various actors, working with the theaters, that why I'm so depressed today is because the journey for this moment has come to an end. And I really don't care what you think about it because you'll tell me you'll like it, you don't like it, you will be honest, you won't be honest, you'll love it, you'll hate it. And you'll just tell me, as someone did the other night, oh, it's lovely. <laughs> well, it's just not lovely. It's either you hate it, you love it, but it's not, oh, it's lovely. Okay. Take lovely. I know, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll take lovely. I'll take it. Okay, I appreciate that. I won't take that. Okay, so therefore the question is, what is success? And I think 
uh, Michael came down here for, he asked me before, I won't reveal it, Michael said, can you please do X for me if we go to Little Rock? Well, I succeeded in getting Michael X. What was that? I'm not telling you. Um, I don't tell. Do you want me to say? If you want. I said, Peter, I need, see, I worked as an actor uh, before I got off the stage and into the pit. And I said, I, I found out I'm two weeks shy of working in the union under a union contract to qualify for a pension. So I said, Peter, when we go forward, what I need is an equity contract, meaning the actor, actor's union, even though I'm working as the musical director and the musician. If I can get two, I only need two weeks work under a contract, I've got a pension for the rest of my life. He said, will you musical direct for me, be, meaning being on stage? This is the first time I've played and conducted this show. I just usually sit out front with them and take notes. I'm having to work to earn my pension. <laughs> but I want my pension, and I'm getting it. Thank you very much. Okay, so... Beca because I knew I could get that done, I, I look back and I go... Well, for my friend Michael, who I've known for 40-odd years, you know, that's pretty good. That's pretty successful. Now, let's talk about the show. That's for me, just on a very, very personal level. It's very successful. On another personal level, Patrick is a journalist. This is basically the first piece of theater that he has written. Yeah, the first full one. No, I'm just, I'm just, half a one. But, uh, the other half. <laughs> yeah, but I'm just saying the first full one. And what I adore doing is finding people and finding windows and doors and opportunities for people to expand their lives and change their lives. So again, on a very personal level, I think that has accomplished this over the past five years for Patrick. In uh, let, me, uh, let me talk about that only because um, what's been great about Peter is that he has no rules. Um, and that's terrific. And there's a, uh, a saying that Eleanor Roosevelt has that says, you should do something that scares you every day of your life. And this is terrifying. Absolutely. Sending, push, pushing the send key uh, for, to send p uh, pages to Peter is, is a scary prospect. But it's great because he insists that you send it. And I think, can't I have until Monday, please? No. And it's like, nope, Friday, Friday. And I because I know because, because I know by Monday we'll change it again. <laughs> And speaking of success in the theater and how you define it, Peter's absolutely right. It's the process. It's the joy of the collaboration with Michael and, and with Peter and with the actors. And, um, and at one point, Alan J. Lerner, who, great, great uh, uh, lyricist, book writer of the theater, Brigadoon, My Fair Lady, late in his life, said, at this point, I only do not want to be humiliated. After all that success, after all that tremendous success, and Moss Hart uh, in Act One um, said the theater, it, Moss Hart, again, a, tre a tremendously successful playwright, uh, veteran playwright, said in his memoir, Act One, the theater is the only place, uh, if you're a plumber and the more work you do, the better plumber you become. If you're a surgeon, the more operations you do, the more successful and better surgeon that you do. In the theater, you can write a play and it's the biggest smash hit, and your next one is a huge flop. It's the only profession where you don't necessarily get better because it's such a right. delicate chemical So let's reaction. talk about specifically this production. Um, what we've done is rather bold and, dare I say, with hubris, which is, can you take Pal Joey and make it work? And with the blessing of Ted Chapin, who is the, as I said, the president of the Rogers and Hammerstein estate, we've been for five years with his blessing. He comes to the productions, gives us notes, and in some sense, we are now dependent on Ted Chapin, who's coming Friday night, to say, yes, let's go forward. So therefore, we, have, we, have, we can probably do this again at another regional theater. We can do all sorts of things, but I want to go to London with it. Um, that's my goal, is to, if, if God forbid it is successful, audiences like it, I can raise some money. I do all those things, and Ted Chapin says, yes, I think it should be done in London next for various reasons, because it's been done in New York recently, and it hasn't been done in London for 25 years, and the theater there, there's all sorts of reasons to go to London, uh, would then be what I deem commercial success, right? So again, Bob's question is, I think, very valid, which is, if Ted says, nope, hated it, hated the music, you can't do it, I won't be, I'll be despondent, 
but not unhappy because I think the last five years has been one of the most joyous periods of time working on this and working with Patrick on a movie called Waking Sleeping Beauty and on our Italian venture with Maria Cassi, who's a spectacular actress in Italy, uh, has been a really lovely five years. And I suppose, I, it, as I know we're going to get short here, I read once in Sports Illustrated uh, this story about the guys, very powerful, very, very financially successful guys who would go biking, or they had a biking trip that followed the Tour de France. So they would go the day after the Tour de France and ride the exact same route that the Tour de France rode. And this one guy, they're going up the highest peak, the highest hill, the highest thing, and the other guys are way ahead, and this guy is just laboring to get up the hill. And the ride master comes back and says, do you want to walk, do you want to send us the bike? No, no. And they spend the next half hour together cycling this particular mountain, going up, and he makes it to the top, and everybody else is waiting at the top. They're having lunch, they're waiting, and he sits down, and they're talking about it, and they talk about this very issue, and they're all very rich and very successful, and the moral of this that I came up with was, he who dies with the most stories wins. And I think it's a very beautiful expression, which is you're gathering your own stories. And Patrick and I worked on this musical in Florence, and there's a Florentine expression, which is it's probably better in Tuscanese as opposed to in Italian. It's, the expression is, um, may death find you fully alive. And I think that, to me, is probably the success of being here. It's been a, to Bob and the entire staff, it has been one of those stories we will tell forever. And as Patrick says, we've never been more alive. That's very good. <laughs> Let's open it up for questions. Yes. And we've got microphones probably coming around. Despite the fact that this was not perhaps the most successful of the catalog for um, the writers, still, most audiences have memories of movie, New York productions, and so on. They bring preconceptions. Is that an advantage or disadvantage, and how have you been dealing with that aspect? That's a great question. Have you heard the question? You want to do that one? I, that's a really yeah, good question. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question. I think, I think we're helped to some extent that I think people think they know it better than they actually know it, to some extent. There is the 1957 film by Sinatra, but it bears no relation, practically. He made it into a personal vehicle for himself. So he comes into the club, and he just sings, I didn't know what time it was. Is that the right title, Michael? because he just wanted to sing that song. It bears no relation to whatever he's doing. So it's sort of a personal vehicle for him. Uh, what I think the advantage is, and, and you may agree or disagree, but it is that there are these great standards, bewitched, bothered, and bewildered, and uh, I could write a book. And what I think one of the things that we haven't talked about, and that is to, to some extent, is that I heard uh, once uh, or discovered in my research that two standards that are the most covered in the jazz idiom are by Richard Rogers, My Funny Valentine and My Favorite Things. And that kind of inspired reinterpreting these numbers that people are familiar with um, in, a different, in a different idiom. Um, but I don't think that they are as familiar with the show itself simply because it's not done that often, and it hasn't run that long since 1952. I would answer it differently. Uh, you may walk in with your preconceptions, maybe walk in with, oh, I know what I'm going to see, and within the first 30 seconds, our goal is to take you away from your thought and transport you someplace new, and by the end, you won't ask that question. That, that, so I don't really care whether you know or don't know, because you know Bewitched in a certain way, and what, what we've done with Bewitched has nothing to do with the way it was ever been done before. And when Ted Chapin, which is why we're sitting here, is because when Ted Chapin saw what we did with Bewitched, he said, now if you could do that with the entire show, that would be spectacular. And I think we've done that with Kick It Around, we've done it with Bewitched, we've done it with, uh, I Could Write a Book, we've done it 
in terms of a musical interpretation of it. So yes, you know the tunes, you know it, potentially he's a bit of a cad, but our job is to transport you to magical places every night in the theater, whether it's this or Red or Les Mis or Win Dixie or whatever's in Bob's season coming up. The job is to transport you someplace new. Yes. In uh, 1985, I saw Pal Joey with a community theater in Bristol, England. And I'm going to be in the theater tonight, and I can hardly wait. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Come by and say hello. We'll be scribbling notes like crazy. Yes, in the back. You mentioned several of the roles that are uh, being played. You didn't mention Teddy. Would oh, you, very good. Thank you very would much. Would you talk a little about Teddy? I, I don't, I'm old enough that I may have forgotten that I saw Pal Joey, but they tell me Teddy is a new added character. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, one of our early problems, concerns, issues was how do you tell the tale? How do you theatrically tell the tale? And right or wrongly, we decided to add a new character, a guy called Ted. And our conception is that Ted is the piano player in the bar, and he has written the club song. So he is the composer of the songs. He's Lorenzo Hart, if you may add, of our show, very loosely. And that was sort of the idea, which was it's a theatric, theatrical device to try and help us. You want to talk about it a bit? About it? Yeah, it was, a, it, Ted was actually inspired by a lyric in the song, Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered, and the specific lyric was, I'll sing to him, eat spring to him, and worship the trousers that cling to him. And in thinking about it, I thought, wow, that doesn't sound to me like a lyric that a woman would write about a man or sing to a man. It sounds like a lyric that a man would sing to a man. And in fact, Larry Hart, who was a very sort of, uh, they, they would call him the uh, poet laureate of sadomasochism, because he was always writing these songs about yearning and uh, you know, not being unloved, glad to be unhappy, which is in our show is, is a exam good example of that. So I started thinking, what if we put a character loosely based on Larry Hart in the club? And he would be the narrator. He would take us through this journey about his pal, Joey. Peter uh, um, baptized him Ted, christened him Ted, uh, because Ted is the person that um, Joey is writing letters to in the original O'Hara book. In 1948, as well, the Kinsey Report was published. The uh, study of, the, of human sexuality in the male was published. And there wasn't a word for when a man was attracted to a man, uh, certainly not widespread. And Kinsey first gave it a name. So Ted, in, the, um, in our play, is somewhat sexually confused about it. Uh, I have a friend who is 93, 94, who came to New York, famous playwright, came to New York in 1948, and he, out of the military, and he said, I didn't know I was gay. I couldn't put a name to it. I just knew that I was attracted to men. And that is somewhat how Ted comes into the picture and who also develops a crush on Joey, and they bond over their love of bebop, their love of jazz. Again, trying to make the show more complex, raising the stakes, making it more interesting and more entwined because it's, in some sense, it's a good pot boiler thriller of what's gonna happen. And I know we talk about the themes and all these things. It is pretty joyous as a musical, the tap dancing, the dancing, the singing. It's a really sort of joyous celebration of this particular period in these characters with this sort of under theme because I am not a big fan of just romantic musicals that are not about much of anything. So for me, one has to tell an emotional, compelling, interesting, complex story through the use of music, through the use of, uh, of humor, and try and move you in a direction to be actually questioning your own lives and how you live your lives, and are you with the right person? Because for me, we haven't talked about it, the most important thing that we are dealing with in the 21st century 
is the complexity of relationships, that we're all living longer, and that whole cliche, which is, you know, after 20 years, you'd be dead, and you wouldn't be having a midlife crisis, and you wouldn't be stuck with your same partner who you're bored with, and again, it's dealing with all these issues of what is our responsibility to our partners? How do you have multiple relationships at the same time? How do you have, how does one person fulfill your, all your needs all the time? And dealing with that sort of complexity, which um, I find fascinating, is reflected in this particular piece, right? And one addition to the idea of why is Ted uh, in the show, I think in 1940 when this show was originally done, it was considered very edgy for the time. Uh, some people were outraged by the sexual, what was considered sexual material at the time. And I think in updating it both racially and sexually, it has updated the edge and made it a little bit edgy for our time in uh, introducing these new themes. Well, I'll just say that even, you know, we did a, a spot on TV uh, yesterday, and we were having a conversation about, we always do three songs on our, our television spots, and, you know, Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered is one of the most famous songs, one of the most recognizable songs, and we couldn't sing it on TV, because there's no profanity in it, but it's suggestive. Uh, and so, you know, the, so that was a... Uh, it's inconceivable to me, but that's beside the point. <laughs> I just sat there with my mouth open and said, you can't sing Bewitched on TV? What? Okay. So that's an interesting, and you know, one of the things, as we run out of time here, we, we, I, I want to not ignore the fact, first of all, uh, our fascinating conversation talking thematically, but again, getting back to the point, it's a wonderful musical, and it kicks off with an amazing tap number. So when you measure success, it's not just about the sort of more intellectual underpinnings of the show, which are right there, but the visceral experience when you're in that audience of just getting charged up because there's so many beautiful songs. They come one right after the other, and then interspersed with that are some amazing dance numbers and tap numbers. So, so you get that thrill. You know, uh, Dan Connectus, our choreographer, uh, and the other members of the creative team have not only given us a, um, a well-thought-out story, but also an amazingly theatrical experience when we come to the theater. So I don't want to overlook that. And I want to ask one question, since there aren't any actors here. We had, this was one of the most involved casting processes of any that we've experienced at the Rep. It went on and on and on. But that's good, that's all good. Um, um, uh, because we all had- I, I thought it was a very pleasant process, thank you. I was, it wasn't unpleasant. It, so what, were you, what is it about the casting this show? This is a tough show to cast, am I right? And, and what, what are the challenges? You know, I think every show's a tough show to cast because it really is about personal taste. What I think is a good actor and what Bob thinks is a good actor sometimes aren't the same. So therefore, when you start looking for a character, um, I'll, I'll pick on Linda, because uh, we, we had a hard time finding uh, African-American ladies to come out and audition for us. And she sings this kick-ass song in act two, and for me, it's one of the most musical highlights. There's a certain section in it that, for me, has to thrill you when you hear the voice. And we had lots of auditions, and by the time we finished our first series of auditions, we had somebody who could do the part, was a perfectly fine actress, but the song didn't thrill me. And everybody else said, well, it's good enough. And I said, you know something, if I'm not thrilled when she sings, um, I could write a book, right? There's a little passage right in the middle, which is Michael has done brilliantly. If she can't sing that in this particular manner, which is halfy poppy rocky, halfy classic, half of this, half that, if she can't do this, I don't want to hire her. And everybody says, well, you won't find anybody else. She's the best you're gonna find. And I said, well, let's look harder. And in comes Stephanie, and Stephanie sings the song, and you go, now that's it. And that's what you're looking for as a director, as a casting director, as a producer. You're looking for the moment when everybody says, now that's it. And usually when you cast a show after a long period of time, the creative team usually coalesces. It's quite an interesting process. It's pretty democratic. It's collaborative. It's not democratic. It's collaborative. Usually by the time of a casting process, everybody agrees on who should be cast because that's just the process. That's the way I do things. They try, at the end of the day, everybody goes, 
Okay, now there may be one or two that we all didn't agree on, and maybe they were right, maybe we were right. It makes no difference at this point. Uh, but the re requirements are you have to be, not only for the lead, you have to be African American, you have to be able to tap, you have to be able to sing, you have to be able to dance, you have to be able to act. So in some sense, that is a very complex role to find. And, with no disrespect, you have to be willing to go to Little Rock. <laughs> I mean, that, that, it, actors go, no, no, no. I've got, I'm on, Broadway is hopping at the moment for African-American actors. There's Motown, there, there was The Color Purple. There's sort of nine shows. You go, every single American, African, African-American actor is working. And the ones that aren't working don't want to go to Little Rock because maybe they will be working. So therefore, you again have to find and go through that. So it's always about the serendipitous of who happens to be free. It's true. The theatrical gods have to shine on you to some extent on this. And I think they have. I think we're very pleased with our cast. I think we're very lucky with our cast. Mike Nichols, uh, the famous Mike Nichols, director of, of film and theater and television, said that 80% uh, of his job was casting. And, and, what's, I said, and what's the other 20%? <laughs> I asked him, what's the other 20%? And he said, correcting my casting mistakes. <laughs> They have to walk in the door with it. And uh, pertinent to what Bob was saying, the musical theater is probably the, not the only art form, but one of the best art forms for creating joy. Uh, and I think everybody in the theater, I think, goes into the theater because when they were 10 or 12 or whatever, they saw The King and I or they saw Carousel or they saw something that just made them joyful. And I think, I don't know, if I'm talking out of turn here, but I think everybody that goes into the theater goes into the theater because they want to create joy. That is correct, although the process may not be joyful. <laughs> um, the, most famous yeah. one, the most famous one is probably the recent one is Wicked. Uh, Wicked, which is one of the biggest successes done in the last 20 years financially. It's huge. The creative process was probably one of the most divisive, angry making, yelling, screaming, creative team. Not, you wouldn't know it, but the actual development process was probably one of the most angriest, difficult, people not speaking to each other by the time of opening night, of the people sitting up on this table, the kinds of people, director, producers, writers, uh, musical people, weren't talking to each other with the day the show opened. I'll never talk to you ever again. And then, of course, the checks just start rolling in, and now you have, you're, forced, you're forced to do 40 productions of it, so therefore you get beyond the process because it creates so much joy. It's a difficult, it's difficult. Uh, Larry Gelbart, a humorist, said, if Hitler is alive, he should be out of town with a musical in trouble. That's how difficult it is. Well, you have a quick question, I'm gonna wrap it up. Quick one in, in response to the things you've said. Have you ever cast someone and then had to do a rewrite and found that the person wasn't quite right for the part? You fire them. I'm so sorry. If you don't, it, basically, you don't rewrite the part for them, you find a new actor. Because it's too hard to rewrite it once you start going. And yes, there have been many times that we have changed actors after the first week or the second week. You sit with the producer and you say, and it costs you a certain amount of money, and you just make the decision, and it's painful, and the company is it's ugly for the actors. They all rally around because you, the, the corollary is other actors know perfectly well when the other actor is not working and is not pulling their weight. As painful it is to get rid of the actor, they all go, thank God you did that, right? So you don't really rewrite. You write the words to fit the actors you have, but when something's not working, you get rid of the actor. The obverse is also true. Actors make my words better. They, they, they really do. They, they, made me, they make me look smarter than I am. And as we came up with, Stephanie came up with that idea of introducing this, singing this, instead of my dialogue. And I immediately say, yes, I'm always in favor of getting rid of my dialogue uh, for the musical. Please do so. And it works better. And I'm going to wrap it up only because we're out of time. And I will say that we're talking about, you know, things that happen. This has been, for Arkansas Rep's perspective, one of the most positive supportive, collaborative experiences in the creative process, and I guarantee you that's not always the case. Uh, uh, but this one has been particularly positive for the rep. Uh, and so I'm not only thanking these guys for being here today and giving up rehearsal time to come and talk to you guys, but also for creating such an incredible process that I think shows when you come to see the work on stage. 
the fact that people are supportive, they feel like they've been supported in the process, uh, thanks to the incredible good work that these guys have done. So I want to thank them. I want to thank you for joining us today and the Clinton School for making this all possible. See you at the rep. Thank you.